Good. Uh, good afternoon, PIF. Thank you. That's getting a little bit better every, every time. Um, if you're willing and able to, if you could rise with me as we read uh, today's passage. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be reading from Ephesians chapter 5 uh, ver from verse 21. That uh, may be a very familiar passage to some very equipped uh, with the word here. And so again, we're reading from Ephesians 5 verse 21 and on. And so the Apostle Paul writes to the church, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You guys may be seated again. All right. So this is a fun one. <laughs> I, I often make the joke that I get the fun passages throughout Scripture. So here we go again. Uh, if any of you have ever been familiar with this passage, you know it's a, it could be a bit of a sticky one. Uh, but when I first, not for the first time, the most memorable time that I heard this passage uh, was on the day of my own wedding. Um, now, there wasn't much... There wasn't much memorable about my wedding except for the fact that if you, if you know, it's, uh, my, my wife Sarah and I were married on May of 2020. That's two and a half months into the global pandemic. Uh, where in that, in that era where if you had more than 10 people in your, in your backyard, you uh, called the cops on your neighbors. So that was a pleasant time. But we did a wedding at that time because we knew we had to do it uh, no matter what. We didn't know what the pandemic was going to be, so we just chose May 2020, our original date. Now... When the word was read during that time with the global church at that time, because we were uh, most of the uh, people who were there watched via Zoom uh, in the fledgling days of that. Uh, when I heard this and the fishing was speaking, I remember just being so blown away. I was like, wives, submit to your husbands. I'm like, that's good. And like, oh, man, husbands, love your wives. I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. And like, oh, just do it as, the, as Christ did for the church. I'm like, that's... Man, I just had like this beautiful vantage point. Like that's the first day of the rest of my marriage and I knew from there, wow, that's the kind of marriage that I want. It was so rosy, it was so beautiful. But again, when Paul gets to use this kind of language, he gets to be idyllic as much as he wants to be. Fast forward four and a half years, uh, that's how long my marriage has, uh, has gone. And I have now a, two, a sniffly two-year-old daughter and a insatiable five-month-old son. And as I'm holding them both in either arm to consult their individual needs, I look at my wife and say, how dare you? How can you bring this curse upon my family? I'm just kidding. But like, like we, we really think so much like, oh my gosh, like when we're in this early stage, and I know many of us are not in a marriage phase here, so in, in a sense this word may not apply to you in that manner. But when I was a single man, the last day of my singlehood, I, was, I had such a rosy picture and an idyllic picture of this. And yet, when we're dealing with life, so circumstances coming upon, submit, love one another, be like Jesus. Those sound like great ideas. And in reality, it's a lot tougher <laughs> you might imagine. As we're nearing the end of our series on the book of Ephesians, if you didn't guess, we're on the end of chapter 5, it ends with chapter 6. We are see, we've seen a theme as we're in this uh, uh, series called The Way of Church, that God has a specific way that church should be. And frankly, he's writing this letter because maybe the church hasn't done all that just yet. 
We know that the church is built on this truth that we are individually built in Imago Dei, the image of God. And when we individually indwell in that truth, we come together as people, as the ligaments, as the kneecaps, as the, as the hair follicles, as people who come together with Christ as the head. Then that's when our spiritual gifts come together. That's when the spiritual functions come together. And that's when the church becomes alive. But as we talk about the way of church, this passage may seem a little bit like a, of like a, of like a kind of like a side quest in a sense. But when I think about my own situation here, in a place I could have never conceived about five years to, the, to, to uh, this very day, I have come to truly believe that the true embodiment of the church is not what we do within these walls or go to Guatemala or even uh, serving like someone on the streets or whatever. But I really have come to see that the true embodiment of church is the families that we have to wake up with and go to sleep with every single night. See, the only two people that don't call me pastor, except for, I guess, my friends, really would be my two kids. One, because they don't really speak well. But beyond that, to them, I'm just father. And, fa- and when, I'm, when I'm father, it doesn't matter my, my title. Like, I'm not a deacon to them. I'm not a powerful worship leader. I'm not mega volunteer. I'm not the best welcome person, the, the best pro presenter, t- pr- button pusher of all time. I'm just dad. And when you're that age, that means, why the heck is food not in my belly already, right? So there's a lot, there's a lot, it's a different realm. And I, when I realize when faith becomes alive, and, and the New Testament is very clear about this, especially in Paul's writings, it's not in these ways where we raise our hands the most and sing the best and praise God in all the ways, but it's in these moments when we are in the, the down and dirty with our families, when we're the most vulnerable, when we're just mom and dad, husband and wife. It's in those moments when the church becomes most alive. It's in those moments the facade doesn't exist. And in a beautiful way, when Paul draws these parallels between the church and the family unit, it's because when, we're all, when we can't come to church with these facades, but when we're at home, it, that's the best bleed over that we can ever have. When we're the most organic in relationship, it's in those ways that our worship is shown the most no matter where we go. Friends, we're having this conversation partially because it's, it's in line with the sequencing of this, of this text. But we're also having this conversation today because I really feel that this, there's a backwards nature in our discipleship in the way we practice church. If we're doing a lot more here than what we're doing at home, then what's the point? In fact, it's not anybody here. I, I, no, not, not a single one. Not you online. Nobody. But I've heard that people do this thing where you come to church to almost complain about your family. Like you, come to, you go to church to escape from your family. That my, my parents are like this or my husband and wife are like this or my kids are driving me crazy. So I'm so glad that retreat can't come fast enough. Right? And, that it's, and it's a very backwards mindset. Because instead, if we had a church instead that the family unit is where our first mission field is, where they're no longer a burden, that they're no longer my weight on my shoulders, but instead they're our blessing, then when we start to picture our families in our lives, what will we finally see? A burden or a blessing? Church, I'm inclined to believe that this is a point I want us to remember today. It's this, is that loving our family is a reflection of and submission to God's love for us. Amen? It's this belief that when we are in our family units, that we're not, we're not doing church when we get to this building, but we're doing church every single day with the ones that God has given unto us. And so as we are going into that, we start to realize then that when we, when we see the sticky verse that we're frankly just about to tackle, this idea of submitting to one another, loving one another, being as Christ was to this church, then these become real, real life concepts and not just things that we can tackle on paper. So who's ready, for, who's ready to go into this with me? Amen? Let's do it. So we're starting today with, uh, today our reading starts with this verse. Verse 21, Paul writes to the church, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now you won't see this in your U versions or your Bible apps or anything, but if you are in your paper text, you'll find that this is a standalone verse of sorts. It's kind of like a transition from last week's sermon. I think that's important because uh, this is a quick aside because as obvious as it sounds, submitting to Christ, submitting itself isn't this demonic thing. But unfortunately, U.S. history with, via routes like slavery and even modern views on relationships and gender dynamics 
frankly speaking, the word submit has kind of become a little bit of a taboo. And I understand that the way that it's been uh, used has kind of been a little sticky, right? Especially in the context of this passage that we read today. But it's important because Paul, before addressing individual parties, is very clear to say this. When we submit to one another, it's out of reverence for Christ. When we submit to one another, it's like when Paul went down to the people. It's what, it's what, right, when, when Saul became Paul, right? Jesus is the first one that spoke to him and said, why are you persecuting me when he was persecuting my church? He took it personally. And so in this way, we have to frame this idea of biblical submission on the very idea of submitting to Christ. And this is important because we're now going to move on to uh, what might be one of the more controversial texts, uh, not to Paul, but maybe to a modern reader uh, as we go to verse 22. If you guys could read that with me. Paul writes, wives. It's so much easier, by the way, because my wife's not in the room right now. So I can say this. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do the Lord. Holla back, right? Just kidding. Let's keep reading. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of their husbands in everything. Let's pause there. That's a lot. This has become a well-known passage uh, for many. For men, it's like this place, passage where they're just like, I can't wait to get to that part of Ephesians. But for the ladies and the sisters covered in style and grace in the house. This is a lot. See, this passage hasn't become known in a biblical manner, but it's kind of become, uh, it's, it's drawn the ire of sisters because it's often interpreted, or I'm going to call it right here, misinterpreted in a very sexist, chauvinistic, no matter what kind of obedience. Now, with that aside, I will be honest. I did what every preacher was taught not to do when you're taking a preaching class. I wanted you guys to like me. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to, I went into this text. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, my dream was this. I wanted to come today and be like, no, 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 guys. Like, you got it all wrong. Paul, Paul loves you guys. Like, Paul, Paul, when Paul means submit, submit's like the fifth way to say love in Greek. And, like, you know, I just wanted to kind of massage the truth in and be like, no, we're all on the same team and all that. And even with me attempting that, I have bad news for all of us. Paul said what he said. Paul meant every single word. Unfortunately, as we read this text, we have to be very clear here. It's in Scripture, and as Christians, this is, where the, this is bad news. It's great news. It's our theology, but it's still bad news because as Christians, we have every responsibility to uphold the truth that Scripture is what we call inerrant. It's without error. It's, it's our living authority. And if our, if our very faith is based off of Scripture, the Bible itself, and then we start to kind of finagle with like, oh, you know what, though, like, and that was like back then, but today, like, where we might have a female president and all these things, so it's a little bit of a different world and all that kind of stuff. Here's the deal. If we're moving the measuring stick based off of modern context, then all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation be- comes through at risk the moment we feel like it. And there is no absolute truth that we can invite others into when we invite them to the light and grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so it's our job to, unfortunately, it's in these moments we have to say it, to remind people that in these moments, Paul said what he said. Now, we have to understand that Paul is not just shooting strays at women or womankind here. If you read other letters to the churches of the New, in the New Testament, he actually uplifts women. He promotes them to the roles of deacons and leaders within the church. So you might be thinking, is there an inconsistency? What gives here? Well, to give a little bit of a context here, remember he's writing to the church of Ephesus. Ephesus is a city-state. It's in Turkey now, but back then it was a port city in the Roman Empire. Now, Roman... The, Ephesus in particular was a leading city in the progressive beliefs. And, what I, and why I say that is there's actually a lot of comparisons, as preachers would often say, between Ephesus and New York City. Because what was starting to brew in this time, again, this is the Roman Empire, is that Ephesus started to have a couple more women step up into certain roles. Now, traditionally, in ancient cultures, women played a submissive role to, to men, Right? But what's happening here is that suddenly there was an advent of what they called the new Roman woman. Because the new Roman woman gets an education. Woo! They get jobs in the government. Woo! They get independence. Woo! 
women, you don't love that kind of stuff? Like, <laughs> right? They're doing, this good, they're doing the good in a different time. They were the staple, of, like, in a, revolutionaries in that culture. But why there had to be a mention of a caveat here is not the fact that women in leadership was the problem, but society wasn't ready for that transition. And so here's the problem. We're seeing here that because, like, the, just the society wasn't ready for that shift, suddenly family units start to deteriorate. Because women were, were more busy with their work and education now, birth rates went down, abortions went up, divorces went up, happy families went down. We're seeing a lot of these things in that way that kind of started to see that families and a lot of that secularism started to grow a lot like we see today. Again, not a problem because the women were in power, but because the, 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 cult, the culture just wasn't ready for that shift. Now here's a second problem. Again, we've mentioned this before too, but Ephesus is... The Ephesian uh, temple deity was a goddess named Artemis. Artemis was most famously the woman, uh, the woman god, on, the goddess, as, strict, as crazy as that is. He was the goddess of fertility. So you might imagine that the religious sector of, if, uh, of Ephesus specifically was dominated by womankind. And the problem with that is not the problem that they're the dominant party, but now what's kind of starting to synchronize a little bit is when the gospel's starting to come into Ephesus, Who's going to be the ones to teach it? The religious authorities. And who were the religious authorities? Women who taught in the temple of Artemis. Is the temple of Artemis going to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ? They're going to spread a false gospel. And so that's why you see in 1 Timothy chapter 2, who Timothy, by the way, was stationed in Ephesus, we see that Paul writes that women should not teach. Because again, when we're seeing, when, when there's so much at stake, we have to kind of cut, we can't cut corners. We have to just make a total broad statement there. So that's why we're seeing all this kind of stuff happening. And that's why, in light of all that, Paul is writing to the wives here. Listen, there's too much at stake here. For the sake of the gospel, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. Not because he didn't care and respect for the, the sisters of the house, but because the gospel is at stake. Because that's the bad news. Unfortunately, sorry. However, for those of us who are nudging the ladies next to us, right, and be like, yeah, buddy, I have even worse news for you, if you could pull that up. The worse news is this. Even, yeah, it's biblical, it's a biblical command to submit to the husbands, but the, my question as I stand before you today in full witness of the house is this. Why should they? If you read verse 22 again, and I have it up there, I, if you have your own text, if you have your own Bibles, circle this word. Submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. We have to understand that when we, there is an expectation just by that use of the word as... That you're not saying submit like you do to the Lord, as if he were the Lord. No, as you would the Lord. There is a built-in expectation, church, that the men are called to step up in the house. Verse 25 here says, husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ, here it says, loved the church and gave himself up for the church to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Now, anybody who texts anyone regularly, you know that if you get like a good morning, it's like a nice, short, concise message, you're like, oh, it's a good morning. And then there's a paragraph that comes afterward, and you're like, it's not going to be a good morning, right? And then that same, and so you know concise is usually better. I did the math for you. There were 47 words directed at the wives of this, in this passage. There were 143, more than triple the amount written to the men of the house. Just like a grocery list gets a little bit longer when you have more and more needs, the, list, the, the words get longer and longer when there's a greater need to be done. And in this case, the word had to say that Paul is addressing the husbands, the men of the households here. It's time to step up. He's saying here to love your wife unconditionally as church, as the church was loved unconditionally by Christ. 
it doesn't mean, this passage doesn't mean, hey, a good husband gets a submissive wife so who cooks and cleans and raises the kids and puts them to sleep and does all those other things while you get to watch Sunday Night Football or the World Series or the NBA Finals. The point, a good, faithful, biblical man and husband is, is doing everything possible. If you read the scripture as it is, read it in the red, friends. It says here specifically that a biblical husband does all things possible for the wife for her benefits only. It's our job, just as Christ put a veil on us and made us pure and holy and righteous before the sight of God, it's a man and husband's job to keep his wife and his children and everyone around him under his, under his household pure, blameless, holy, righteous in God's sight. That's the command of Paul here, to be like the Lord, as and then the wives will naturally submit. Friends, when we read, that's why there's this parallel between family and church here. If we are truly living and as people, not just the men here, but everybody here, if we're living in this reality that Jesus loves us to the core, as I said before, then we see our families not as silos and outlets and siphons of our grace and what we need, but they are a reflection and of our submission to God's infinite love for us. Amen? Amen? Come on now. But like I was saying here, this isn't Brother Bashoff 3000, okay? We're not, trying to, we're not just trying to rip the men here. We also have a role to play here. If you read the rest of what Paul is saying here in verse 28, he says, In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of the body. Right? For this reason, he's quoting from Genesis here, a man will leave his mother, father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. It's addressed to the husbands, but let's be clear. You're not going to be one with somebody else, and they're not going to be one without you, okay? So this is addressed to both parties here. Because Paul's bringing logic into the situation. When you are married in the day of, every official will tell you the two have become one now. Go in peace. You are now a one body. And in that same way, when we are, and when we, you know, when we're still single, we'll do everything to supply and, nutri- uh, just, and give ourselves the proper nutrition. We'll eat the right things. We'll count our macros. We'll lift what we need to. We'll jog the marathon. We'll avoid the fast food. We'll have the fast food, and then we'll run off the fast food. We'll do all these things. But when we're th- when all of a sudden, when we come to our marriage, we think they're my problem. I told you before, my son cannot stop crying his head off. And I'm looking at my wife, I'm like, why is he, why is he just like you? Until my, wife, until my mom reminds me that I'm out to cry baby in the household. So I, I apologize, Sarah. But in all seriousness, when we are conjoined by the covenant, that's why a covenant marriage is so beautiful and sacred, but also so scary. Because it's the only thing that really looks like Christ and his church. That is us. We have to come before one another and to just start putting one another's needs before the other. Not just in marriage context. If you're dating, date in your dating relationship, in your friendships, even with you and your own parents, in the future, you with your own kids. Every relationship needs a surrender component to it. The ever-quotable Tim Keller says in his seminal book, The Meaning of Marriage, one that I'm sure every single one of you will read once it comes to premarital time, he says this, true love is not just a feeling, but a daily choice to put the needs and happiness of your spouse before your own. Here's the thing. As I've kind of been alluding to this whole time, that is so much easier said than done. The crazy thing about this is once, you're, once marriage is kind of like that never-ending treadmill at that point, the babies will come. The life situations will come. And there's no skill seminar, TED Talk, book, or even a, 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 re, a rereading of Meaning of Marriage. That, that can't help you. The only thing that we can understand at that point is when we're in our youth, we will be selfish people that will always uh, gain, gain, gain for myself. Even in a dating relationship, we're inherently selfish. That's just called. 
And so why this is so applicable to us is because the core, again, is to come back to biblical submission. Now, there is precedent for this. There's precedent for a couple being very selfish and just ruining everything. If you've ever heard of Adam and Eve, raise your hand, right? Like, if you've ever heard of Adam and Eve, raise your hand. Now, think for a second. Man, what do I remember Adam and Eve about again? Oh, right. They're, they're like the ones that had a nice family portrait where Adam was sitting like this, Eve next to him, Cain and Abel around him like this, and God in the back kind of like giving them the hedge of protection, right? Or... They have all of mankind and human history to this point debating whose fault was the fall. That's what we remember Adam and Eve for. Because what's happening here is that this passage is emblematic of a broken relationship with holes all throughout. When people are not submitting to one another in love, but instead trying to get their own here. And you'll realize it's Adam and Eve, not, you know, Madam and Steve and that whole thing, right? We're seeing here husbands and wives play respective roles in a respective falls here. In truth, Eve was the one to eat the fruit. But the next verse says what? Adam was like, that's a great idea. Let me have some too. But when the big man in the sky finally asked, what happened, guys? Where are you? She's all like, yo, the serpent made me do it. And he's all like, the woman that you made out of me did that to me. They weren't in this race together, friends. They weren't practicing the covenant. And at the end of the day, they were exp- their brokenness was exposed and they were kicked out of the garden. Instead of submitting to one another in love, they were just blaming one another so that they could just escape unscathed out of this. And that's why, and you see this is uh, specifically directed at Adam in Genesis 3.19, later at, at, towards the end of that curse, God calls him and says, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Frankly, it's no coincidence then that the very reason that, the, that we are fallen human beings is the covenant of marriage. It's not an accident that man and woman fighting is the very reason there's a ripple in time and now we're all living as sinners. Right? It's no coincidence that the very covenant design that we are supposed to look just like Jesus in the church, a scar and a wound in the relationship is what broke all of creation. Frankly, the truth is that every single one of us would have done the same exact thing. Maybe not eat a fruit because we got better things to do at this point. But the truth, the truth still applies. We would all try to get our own. There's nothing that we can do. We're stuck as sinners. Uh, we're all falling short. We're, we're, all, uh, we're all in need of rescue. And that's why, friends, to be honest with you, relationships are inherently broken. That's why we're all fighting. That's why we have struggles as relationships. As a church, there's so much infighting. In, in, in our households, there's always so much infighting. In, in, in personal relationships, it doesn't have to be dating. It just be friendships. So much infighting. Because we're just all in that same place. But... I gave us the bad news here, and I gave us the even worse news. So I think it's finally time for me to give us the good news. And hear me if you say amen if you've said this, if seen this before. Jesus has rescued us. Amen? Jesus is the new and better Adam. He saved us from the pit. And the craziest thing is, the very thing that Adam and Eve did, Jesus did for his church. He submitted himself willingly upon the cross. Philippians 2 verse 8 says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. While Adam and Eve just couldn't get out of their own way, they couldn't get out of their own disobedience, Jesus owns up all of our issues, all of our problems. He submitted himself, blameless as he was, to the Father. And that's why we call Jesus the new and better Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, For in, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Friends, when you really think about this, there, it has so many implications for our relationships, for our marriages here. Because the curse of Adam was broken because with his life, Jesus actually enacted several, several reversals here. Check it out. Adam was willing, Adam and Eve were willing to throw their beloved away before God to save themselves. Jesus came to save his beloved church by willingly throwing himself before God. Adam and Eve's covenant relationship faltered and they were punished with eternal death. But Jesus invited all those who were broken and weary into a relationship with him so that they may have eternal life. 
And Adam and Eve uh, catered to their demise because they, couldn't, uh, they just couldn't resist the call and because they ate a fruit of a tree. Well, Jesus cemented our adoption as sons and daughters of the living king by dying on that same tree. Friends, when Paul is saying to both of us, submit ourselves to, our, to the other as you would the Lord. Love your spouse as Jesus did for his church. This is what he's talking about. When he's talking about these things, it's not this hokey, like, easy believers and try a little bit harder kind of stuff. It's the very core belief that we are those who are so beautifully and so undeservingly loved by God that we are just to pour out onto others this overflow, and that is our families. That is our friends. That is our church. That is our people all around. That is the world around us. Because he came and died for us, his church, his beloved bride. As Tim Keller says a little later in his book, the gospel, he says, is this. That we are more sinful and flawed in, uh, in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. For those of us who have given our lives to Jesus, this is a very easy thing to believe. And yet, why does it get so much harder to put our families first? Why does it get so much harder to do so when, we are for, when, when our families get involved. This is a pleasant reminder to us. And I'm talking about this, by the way. The cross. The cross is our reminder that we were so deeply rooted in sin and we undeservingly received his grace. And that very cross then is the very cross that usually comes in the, in the center of it all when a marriage covenant is ensued. Because it is only by the blood and by the grace of that cross, by the very grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we are able to experience that same thing. As I call the worship team up at this time, as Paul frequently reminds us throughout this passage, friends, it's always family first. Wives, submit yourselves your husbands as you do the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy and righteous and beautiful before the Lord. And friends, this is a beautiful invitation to all of us today that before we can do any of that, that we must be indwelt with the spirit of the living God to love him so much that all of this will be a gracious outpouring unto those that we are to called to love first and foremost, the family that he gave us and he alone. Amen.